I think it's fair to say that few characters outside of the Triforce wielders in Legend of Zelda have the same zeal and fanfare behind them that Skull Kid does. Maybe Midna and Tingle in a sort of begrudging way, as well as Majora, but her popularity is interwoven with Skull Kid. The love for Skull Kid is absolutely next level, from more appearances in spin-off games than nearly any other side character, to literally thousands of different tattoos, the Skull Kid has had a long shelf life after the release of Majora's Mask. Of course, Majora's Mask wasn't the first appearance of the Skull Kid, was it? And it wasn't the last, either. The Skull Kids are as tragic as they are interesting. Although they've only appeared in a handful of mainline games, they've played the role of both enemy and ally, and they've managed to define themselves as one of the oddest and most interesting races in Hyrule. Today on Hyrule History, we're going to look at the Skull Kid as a race, as well as the specific character named Skull Kid in Majora's Mask. We'll look at what makes them tick, and then we'll talk about some theories, like if the Skull Kid in Twilight Princess is the same Skull Kid in Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask. We'll also talk about some controversies around the Skull Kid, and by the end, I think we'll have a sophisticated understanding of exactly what people find so captivating about this little forest dude. Skull Kids are perpetually trapped in a state of adolescence, and this is portrayed in the way they look across the series. The Skull Kids seen in Ocarina of Time are the first ones encountered in both the series and the timeline, and thus they are the defining model the rest of the series follows. While the Skull Kids do vary in appearance from game to game, there are a few staples in their design. They're generally child-sized, wear tattered old clothes with a tall hat seemingly made of straw or leaves, and they tend to portray an orange and brown color scheme. The Skull Kids are also prone to carrying musical instruments, such as a flute or a trumpet. The Ocarina of Time Skull Kid originally had a face that's pitch black with large orange lips, but this was changed to a face with a wooden texture and a beak in Ocarina of Time 3D for reasons we'll get to later. The singular Skull Kid in Majora's Mask shares the design philosophy of Ocarina of Time's Skull Kid, but his character model was changed enough to provide him with a unique appearance to serve his role as a main character. The browns and oranges were made more red and yellow to better complement Majora, and the clothing overall is changed to be a bit less loose-fitting, and his hat is wholly unique. He does have similar accessories, however, sharing his shoes, gloves, and belt with the Skull Kids from Ocarina of Time. And although he spends the majority of the time wearing Majora and concealing his face, the black shadowy skin and orange lips are traded away for a wooden skin texture and beak that the Ocarina Skull Kids would also adopt in Ocarina of Time 3D. So, fast forward hundreds of years into the future to Twilight Princess, and the Skull Kids look radically different. They're still about the size of a child, and they still dress in clothing obviously inspired by the forest they live in, but the similarities begin to end there. His clothing is much more simplified, with a large robe or frock, and a large straw hat nearly the same size as him. He seems to have traded his flute in for a horn, and he carries a lantern around everywhere he goes. But by far the most noticeable and dramatic difference is his skin color. Over the span of years between Ocarina of Time and Twilight Princess, the Skull Kid's skin has changed completely, going from pitch black or wood grained to a bright bluish gray, and his beak has given way to a large toothy gray. In. It's tough to know what to attribute such a radical change to, but the nature of the change gives us some hints. His large, pointy, Hylian-like ears and the changing of skin from wood grain to human-like flesh suggests that perhaps in the many intervening years, there may have been some crossbreeding between Skull Kids and Hylians, which is both horrible to think about, but could explain such shocking phenotypical changes. So we've cemented the fact that Skull Kids do vary in appearance, but there's one thing that stays true regardless of how many years have passed. Skull Kids are forever found deep inside massive forests, like the Lost Woods or Faron Woods. Some say that this is because travelers are more likely to be lost and at their mercy, but I think it's likely just a byproduct of their evolution, as we'll discuss a bit later. Skull Kids are essentially children, so they live their entire existence as one big game. They're mischievous and cunning, and they can be violent and cruel. However, they can also be kind and helpful, and above all else, the Skull Kid desires nothing more than a good prank and some enjoyable companionship. They're very quick to accept strangers, as seen by the various Skull Kids' immediate acceptance of Link and the Kokiri in general, or even Tattle and Tail. 
In fact, Skull Kids can be very kind, and they enjoy giving gifts to their friends. Most of the time, they truly do embody the quizzical, adventurous, and loving spirit of a child. However, having the heart of a child comes with having the emotions, naivete, and temper of a child as well. Skull Kids have been shown to wear their heart on their sleeve, so to speak, and they often leave themselves emotionally vulnerable. When their feelings are hurt, it's been shown numerous times that the Skull Kids have a very bad temper and are quick to anger. When they are upset, they tend to throw nasty, violent tantrums that may harm those around them. Much like a child, Skull Kids are overly capable of being downright mean and nasty, and very selfish. Deep down though, Skull Kids are just as lonely and vulnerable as any other child, and this is really shown in Majora's Mask with how poorly Skull Kid deals with the supposed rejection of the four giants. However, the flip side is that they're entirely capable of learning right from wrong, also showcased at the end of Majora's Mask. There is a theory that Skull Kids were formerly Kokiri children who got lost in the forest, which is an idea we'll dive into in a bit more depth later on. For now though, assuming that it is true that Skull Kids were formerly Kokiri at one point, it would mean they're likely immortal. This is further supported by a story told to Link by Anju's grandmother, where he's told that Skull Kid has been a friend of the giants for about a century. This immunity to age would naturally lead to them being defensive over time, as much like lobsters in real life, the odds of them meeting death at the hands of something fatal is ever present. This fact is what likely leads to them being so mistrusting of adults, and why they simply attack them on sight. The very first time a Skull Kid appears in the series, in terms of both chronological release and timeline, is in Ocarina of Time. The game begins in the southeast of Hyrule, in Kokiri Forest. Here, the Kokiri live in a village built at the base of the Great Deku Tree, who uses his power to protect the Kokiri from threats stemming from the forest around them. The forest itself is dangerous, you see, with monsters abound and even the threat of Ganondorf. But the Deku Tree is able to keep the Kokiri safe, that is, as long as they stay within the boundaries of his influence. If one is to wander outside the influence of the Great Deku Tree, they're liable to be cursed. Cursed with transformation. It's said that those who become lost in the forest are changed into monsters. The forest isn't only inhabited by Kokiri, though. There are Deku scrubs and moblins, and of course, there are Skull Kids. Skull Kids are, well, they're imps, small children-like creatures who inhabit the space inside the Lost Woods. They can be found scattered about the forest, but the likeliest first encounter will be with a lone Skull Kid dancing atop a tree trunk, playing Saria's song on his flute. This makes sense, as Saria is a loving and nurturing person, and it's not surprising to learn that she has a soft spot for the Skull Kids. The lone Skull Kid wishes to befriend Link as well, and gives him a small gift. The second and third Skull Kids found in Ocarina of time are even deeper in the woods and can be found playing music together. If Link approaches them, they're very eager to allow him to play along, and if he manages to keep up, they'll also offer him gifts of friendship. The Skull Kids can also be encountered again later in the game as adult Link. However, they do not recognize him and they attack him on sight as they are fearful of grown-ups. The sick jam sessions would not be the only interaction the Hero of Time would have with the Skull Kids. The playful race of forest imps would return to his life in a big way. Skull Kids, or rather a singular Skull Kid, would have a major focus in Majora's Mask as the primary antagonist is actually a Skull Kid, who simply goes by the name Skull Kid. The story of Skull Kid is a pretty sad one. He was close friends with the four giants of Termina for a very long time, and they grew quite fond of him as well. However, there came a point where the four giants decided it was time for them to conserve their strength and lay dormant until they were needed. They each took 100 steps away from the center of Clock Town, towards the four different corners of Termina, and lay dormant. The Skull Kid naively misinterpreted this as them abandoning him, and he became very hurt, very afraid, and above all else, very lonely. 
The Skull Kid is now by himself in Termina, with nothing to keep him company but his thoughts, and that terrible sadness slowly changing into a sense of betrayal, which itself festered into anger. The anger brooded into hate, and the hate caused his childlike sense of wonder to turn into a much more adult sense of vengeance. It turned his inherent carefree and mischievous nature into something full of malice and despair. However, one dark and stormy night, he meets two fairies named Tattle and Tail, and the three of them became very close friends. For a while, things were okay, but in the back of his mind, he was trying to replace the giants instead of letting them go, and it just wasn't the same. This ongoing inner turmoil attracted the attention of the evil being known as Majora, who lay dormant in the possession of the Happy Mask Salesman. Whether it was through the will of Majora or just bad luck, we may never know, but Majora ended up in the Skull Kid's hands. By this point, the Skull Kid had robbed both the Happy Mask Salesman and Link, stealing both their prized possessions, Majora and Link's Ocarina. At this point in time, Skull Kid is utterly overwhelmed with hate, and this allows Majora to extend into every crevice of Skull Kid's mind, amplifying the instability of his emotions until they snap, allowing Majora complete control. In his rage and with the power of Majora at his disposal, Skull Kid causes a great deal of damage around Termina and sends the moon on an apocalyptic crash course into Clocktown. After many repeated three-day journeys, the Hero of Time manages to summon all four giants, who succeed in grabbing the moon before it crashes into Clocktown and temporarily saving Termina from destruction. However, the sudden appearance of the four giants shocks Skull Kid, and he doesn't have the strength or conviction to fight his old friends. After all, in his heart, he's merely a lonely and hurt child. This disgusts Majora, who tosses Skull Kid aside like a dirty rag and flies off to the moon, where the evil Mask and Link do battle for the final time. The Hero of Time defeats Majora, and Termina is finally safe. However, as a last request before fading off again, the giants ask Tattle and Tail, as well as Link, to forgive their small friend. Skull Kid catches on to this and comes to the realization that the giants do still cherish his friendship, despite not being with him anymore, and that he had two amazing friends available to him all along as well as Link, who was happy to forgive Skull Kid, despite all the harm he caused. The point of this is to show that even though the Skull Kid is a child at heart, he is still capable of learning right from wrong, even in the most extreme of cases. All he needs is a little bit of forgiveness. I think Skull Kid's story in Majora's Mask is beautiful and touching. It's not a story about Machiavellian machinations and world domination, but rather one about the importance of the healthy expression of emotions and the fragility of mental health. It's about how important a good support network is. If Skull Kid had some reliable friends around him when the giants left, he may have been able to better process his emotions and the entire instance may have been avoided. I think this is a really touching message for Majora's Mask to send. Of course, in the end, it never really happened, did it? Or maybe it did? Eh, it's honestly hard to say. Let's talk about it. I am, of course, referring to the much maligned passage about Majora's Mask found in the game's section in the Legend of Zelda Encyclopedia, and I wouldn't be doing my due diligence if I didn't bring it up in a video all about Skull Kid. I also want to specify that I am specifically talking about the English translation of the Zelda Encyclopedia. I know that the Japanese translation is different and is more canon since it is the original, but the English one is the one that most of us have read, and it's the one that has has people so upset. Before we talk about why everybody hates it so much and whether or not it's true, it's best for all of us to be on the same page. From page 36 to 37 of the encyclopedia. When a school kid steals Majora's mask from a traveling mask salesman, the combination of the school kid's burdened heart and the evil magic within Majora's mask transforms the world into the land of Termina. Termina is a parallel world with its own distinct culture, which is perhaps influenced by Majora's ancient tribe. This land is also inhabited by races and individuals similar to those found in Hyrule, which were constructed from the Skull Kid's memories and delusions. While many of Hyrule's races, like Gorons and Azora, are present in Termina, the world feels twisted, different, full of mechanical advances and watched over by a sinister moon looming large and on course to crush it all. In Clocktown, at the heart of Termina, there's a story passed down telling of four guardian giants. According to the story, the giants once lived together in harmony with the town, and there's also mention of a mischievous imp, the Skull Kid. 
The four giants were spirit friends of the Skull Kid, who, much like Termina itself, were created in a new form by the power of Majora's Mask. As for the Skull Kid's past deeds, they are now legend among the people of Termina. As the legend continues, the giants are sealed away and Termina is fated to be destroyed by the swiftly falling moon. Luckily, the Hero of Time appears to defeat Majora's wicked embodiment and breaks the curse of Majora's Mask. While the hero's pure heart allows the world of Termina to momentarily revel in its salvation, as soon as he departs, the world ceases to exist. Having learned his lesson, the Skull Kid makes amends with his friends, the giants, and thus the world in his heart also finds peace and is able to greet the dawn of a new day. So the basic idea is that Termina didn't exist until Majora found Skull Kid, who was racked with grief and latched onto him. The combination of Majora's power and Skull Kid's intense emotion created a ripple effect powerful enough to change Hyrule into Termina temporarily. Then when Majora is defeated and Skull Kid's troubled heart is calmed, Termina ceases to be, existing only in Skull Kid's heart. The Encyclopedia is a heavily criticized book at the best of times, but this is easily the revelation within the Encyclopedia that people hate the most. Many people feel like it's a betrayal of the source material to revisit it decades later and within the span of a couple paragraphs determine that this entire game never actually happened. As a result, the general Zelda fandom has sort of collectively decided this entry in the Encyclopedia is largely nonsense. So why do people believe that it's nonsense, and are they correct? Well, part of the reason is that the entry itself manages to contradict itself and the established lore a couple of times in the span of two paragraphs. The most obvious contradiction to me is the creation of Termina by the combination of Majora's power and Skull Kid's anguish. The problem is that chronologically this doesn't make sense. We know that the reason Skull Kid is so devastated is because the four giants left him, that's specifically why he's upset. But the reason the giants left him is because they needed to go to the four corners of Termina and lay dormant to conserve energy and protect it. And according to the book, they weren't created in the form we know them in until Termina was created. So how could Skull Kid be devastated enough to create Termina if they didn't leave Skull Kid until Termina was already created? Termina would need to exist first for this to happen. It's like the windmill paradox, but not intentional. In Anju's story, the giants are specifically labeled as leaving him for the sake of protecting Termina, which starts his depression. But the book claims that his depression mixed with Majora is what created Termina, even though his depression stems from the giants leaving him to defend Termina, despite Termina not existing yet. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a bunch of nonsense. It also isn't clear whether Termina is a real place or not. The book says that Termina greets the dawn of a new day after the defeat of Majora, but it also claims that it ceases to exist. Which is it? It can't be both at the same time. I imagine they're trying to imply that it ceases to exist in the material world, but continues to exist in Skull Kid's heart. But if that's what you want to say, then just say that. The text as written does a terrible job of explaining this. Why does it blanketly say that Termina ceases to exist if this isn't true? Ceases to exist implies it disappears in totality, but the line about Skull Kid's heart suggests that it does continue, though it doesn't specify if this is in a literal sense or just in Skull Kid's imagination. Now let's get a little esoteric about it and look at some deep lore that also contradicts this idea. The idea that Termina isn't a physical place also contradicts with Phantom Ganon in Wind Waker. Phantom Ganon's sword has a touch mark on it that writes out the name of the person who forged it, or the people who forged it, I should say, Zubora Gabora, who are the blacksmiths in Termina. This implies that they made his sword, which means it was a physical place that Phantom Ganon was able to visit. If the Skull Kid's heart theory is correct, then Phantom Ganon managed to somehow make it into and out of the smithy in the three days that Termina existed, and had them somehow craft his sword in that time while totally missing Link's visit to the smithy. And if this is the case, and they are working on Phantom Ganon's sword during their only three days of existence, I got to wonder why we don't see his sword being forged when Link visits the smithy. It's just a bit suspect is all. 
And the primary reason I hate this theory is just because it's lazy. They just took the big plot twist from Link's Awakening and applied it to Majora's Mask. It's doubly funny because the two games are right next to one another in the encyclopedia. So if you read through both entries sequentially, you're immediately struck with how identical they are, only one being in Link's mind and the other being in Skull Kid's heart. I think it not only does a disservice to Majora's Mask, but it also makes Link's Awakening a little bit less special, since that plot twist is no longer unique to it. I really dislike this theory as much as everybody else does. So is this idea true? Well, there's mixed answers. The book itself prefaces with a note that suggests that everything inside is merely an interpretation, but as Monster Maze points out in his excellent video on the topic of Zelda canon, everything inside the book was approved by Nintendo, and much of it may have even been written by them. So the writers may not have been freelancers who butchered the story like everybody assumed, but it may have been a Nintendo-employed writer who did so. And at the very least, Nintendo was okay enough with the idea to allow it to be published, since we know as a result of Monster Maze's video that they kept a pretty close eye on things. So maybe it is meant to be true. Then again, maybe not. Miyamoto and Aonuma have both been on record on different occasions, admitting that they don't really care too much about hard-coded lore, and that the books were done more as a favor to the fans. The Zelda team adores the different interpretations of the lore of Zelda, and if you were to tell your interpretation of Majora's Mask's story to Aonuma, I have a feeling he'd feel like it was just as valid as anything in the encyclopedia. Anyways, I digress. The Skull Kid isn't finished with the series yet. Many, many years in the future, the Hero of Time's descendant would have a run-in with the Skull Kid as well. In Twilight Princess, while inside Faron's wood, Link and Midna become hopelessly lost. However, when all seems for naught, a Skull Kid appears and leads Link to his destination. Along the way though, he chooses to play a very sick, sadistic version of Hide and Seek. Every once in a while, the Skull Kid will hide and summon a few very lethal wooden puppets to attack Link. Once Link defeats the puppets, the Skull Kid returns and continues leading Link along the path, using the light of his lantern and the sound of his horn. Interestingly enough, this Skull Kid is playing Saria's song. After a while, the Skull Kid appears to have tricked Link and led him to a dead end. He summons multiple waves of puppets and jumps just out of reach. However, Link is able to dispatch the puppets and take a few swings at Skull Kid. This is actually enough to please the Skull Kid, who seems honestly delighted with the scenario. He thanks Link earnestly for the fun before rewarding him with the secret entrance. Much like the Skull Kid's ancestors rewarded the Hero of Time's friendship after playing a game with them, much, much later in Twilight Princess, Link and Midna must once again return to the Sacred Grove, and they are once again aided by the Skull Kid, although they are once again forced to play the Skull Kid's version of Hide and Seek. This time, however, they're led to the Temple of Time, and at the end, the Skull Kid vocalizes that he enjoyed himself. On future visits, the Skull Kid does not appear other than the occasional flicker of the lantern from a Skull Kid who's still determined to always help his new friend find his way through the dangerous forest. The Legend of Zelda fandom is easily one of the most active video game fan bases, and just about every aspect of every game has been written up into some theory or other. The Skull Kid race, as well as the character Skull Kid, are absolutely no different. Here's some of the most interesting theories that I've found. So the first theory suggests that the Twilight Princess generation of the Skull Kid shares rather eerie similarities with the Imp Po enemy. Both are very small, both are mischievous in nature, although one is clearly more violent than the other. And aside from their appearances, both carry nearly the exact same lantern. It's also worth noting that in both Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask, Skull Kids are often referred to as imps. This is likely just a shot at their size, but it's interesting nonetheless. It's widely believed that the Impo is the result of a Skull Kid's spirit being transformed after dying, but I personally invest in the idea that it's the result of an individual Skull Kid who is unable to hold onto their sanity in the forest. As they lose the last grips of humanity they have, they simply become mindless killing machines. Others yet believe that after the death of the Great Deku Tree, all Skull Kids became evil, losing access to his protection and slowly transforming into Imp Pose over the years, and that the Skull Kid in the Sacred Grove was a very singular exception. Probably the most popular theory surrounding the Skull Kid is the idea that the Skull Kid from Majora's Mask is also the Skull Kid you meet in Ocarina of Time. 
the one who gives you a heart piece for playing Saria's song to be more specific. The major bit of proof offered is the little bit at the end of Majora's Mask. After defeating Majora and easing the Skull Kid's mind, he mentions to Link that he smells the same as the fairy boy who taught me that song in the woods. The second bit of proof is also at the end of the game. After the credits roll, the screen will settle on a still of the picture Skull Kid carved into the log, and after a bit of time passes, a minimalist version of Saria's song plays in the background. And while this is just a bit of small conjecture, it's interesting indeed that the Skull Kid in question from Ocarina of Time also has a fixation on mass wanting a certain mask he sees Link wearing from the Happy Mask Shop. The only awkward part of the consistency of this theory is that in Ocarina of Time, the Skull Kid immediately recognizes the song by name, suggesting that it was taught to him not by Link, but by Saria, which contradicts what he says at the end of Majora's Mask. While the recognition is a valid argument and could lead one to believe that it is the same Skull Kid from Ocarina of Time, another possible scenario that I tend to lean towards is the idea that the song became very popular among the Skull Kid race, almost becoming an anthem or a folk song of sorts. And that's sort of where I fall in regards to Saria's song. I think that it just became a culturally significant song within Skull Kid society. And that brings me to the last theory which is the most interesting to me personally, and that's whether or not the Skull Kids truly are Kokiri, or used to be Kokiri at any rate, and if not, how are they able to individually survive for so long? As mentioned earlier, in Majora's Mask, Anju's grandmother tells a story about the Skull Kid and how he had been friends with the four giants long before they entered their sleep, long enough at least to develop a very deep and profound friendship, and this would have been an exceedingly long time before the events of the game began. If this is indeed true, it's not out of the question whatsoever that they may be immortal just like the Kokiri, and if they indeed are immortal, it would make perfect sense that this attribute was something acquired from their former life as a Kokiri who are also immortal. Simply getting lost and transforming is not likely to erase something like immortality from their genes. If it is true that Skull Kids are a product of Kokiri who wandered far enough into the forest to get lost and no longer be under the protection of the Deku Tree's magic, that would mean that they're distantly related to Stalfos, cousins even. And for the record, the encyclopedia confirms this idea. I quote the following from page 50. And it reiterates this on page 102. Now take this information with a grain of salt, as we do all encyclopedia entries, but it really only confirms a theory that the game itself seems to heavily hint at. And of course, there's the fact that the original Japanese name of the Skull Kids are Stall Kids, so it seems pretty convincing that they are indeed related to the Stalfos. The Skull Kid has appeared in a number of other Zelda spin-offs, and even a few non-Zelda games. In Smash Bros Ultimate, the Skull Kid wearing Majora's Mask maintains his place as an assist trophy, but both he and the generic Skull Kid appear as spirits. The generic Skull Kid appears as a grab type spirit with no traits, and THE Skull Kid appears as Skull Kid in Majora's Mask a grab type spirit as well that saps the opponent's life force when they're struck. Skull Kid also has his first directly controllable appearance in Hyrule Warriors, using his ocarina to fight and creating puppets a la Twilight Princess. He also plays a role in Linkle's storyline, serving as our antagonist for part of it. As well, he appears as part of Young Link's focus spirit attack and is a color palette for one of Lana's costumes. So all in all, Skull Kid got an assist trophy as well as two spirits in Smash Ultimate and representation as well as direct control in Hyrule Warriors. He also appears as a playable character once again in the DLC for Cadence of Hyrule, a Legend of Zelda themed sequel to the hit indie rhythm game Crypt of the Necrodancer. In this DLC, he's the main character of the Symphony of the Night storyline, where he can use his different masks to perform different actions in his quest to defeat Skull Ganon. Skull Kid also makes an appearance in the Monster Hunter franchise, appearing as a mask that is wearable by your feline ally in the JRPG spin-off Monster Hunter Stories, exclusive to the 3DS version. I also want to take a moment to mention that the original Skull Kid model unfortunately comes pretty close to engaging in blackface. 
It's not known whether Nintendo intentionally made the Skull Kid look like a blackface minstrel or a gollywog, but Nintendo has a history of utilizing the caricatures of black people in their games in some pretty blatant ways. I'll include some articles on the matter so you can see for yourself, because I don't want to display those sort of deplorable images in my video. Blackface is a vile thing and Nintendo is unequivocally in the wrong for utilizing it with the Skull Kid. As mentioned earlier, they remedied this as early as Majora's Mask changing Skull Kid's skin to a woody texture and replacing his lips with a beak. This change was retroactively applied to the Skull Kids in Ocarina of Time 3D. Make no bones about it, if you make any stupid comments about this or dispute the racism inherent to the practice of blackface, your comment will be deleted before it even sees the light of day and you'll be blocked from commenting about it any further. There's no negotiation on this matter. On a lighter note, as a race, the Skull Kids are as fascinating as they are mysterious. And as a character, Skull Kid is tragic, believable, and ultimately very touching. While the race as a whole seems to have survived to some extent in the child timeline, they as of yet have not appeared in either of the other two timelines, and with no appearances in Breath of the Wild. They were likely wiped out in the adult era, and while they have not appeared in the decline timeline yet, this could very well simply be because the timeline consists of mostly older games, and seeing as the Lost Woods is mostly untouched, I think it's very reasonable to think that they may still be lurking in the woods, playing tricks on each other and harassing travelers with their antics. Regardless of which timeline they did and didn't survive in, I think I can safely speak for all of us when I say that I hope we see those little troublemakers again someday. Thanks for watching as always. If you like what I do and you'd like to support the channel, you can subscribe, you can like the video, share it with a friend, or come talk to me at Discord or on Twitter. If you'd like to support me more directly, you can come over to my Patreon and pledge which will allow you to join the Sabrosian Parade, which you will probably have seen by now marching across the bottom of the screen. And as always, stay safe out there. If you find yourself alone and stranded in the middle of the Lost Woods, maybe keep your eyes open for the flick of a lantern or the shake of some wooden instruments. You never know who might be out there willing to help guide you to safety, because it's dangerous to go alone.